Hey everyone, welcome back to Cyber Grey Matter. In today's video, we're going to be diving into threat hunting. A subscriber recommended this, and it bumped it to the top of my list. This video isn't meant to dive into the super technical details, but rather is meant as a high-level overview to help the viewer get the basics of threat hunting and how it can fit into an organization of various intensities. The philosophy of threat hunting isn't straightforward, and it depends on the size of an organization, how many people are on the team, and the end goal of the program. Sometimes there won't even be a program, and it'll be one or two analysts carrying out responses to alerts and doing investigations. It's important to distinguish the difference between reactive and proactive security. When it comes to attacks, the main goal is either stopping them or lessening the damage when they happen. When we're reactive to something, we handle it after the fact. In cybersecurity, this is when the first signs of attack become visible and start to cause harm. Think about incident response in an organization. The effects begin after the incident occurs, and we often aren't sure of the severity or what's truly going on in the instance of an attack stage or even how much damage is actually being done. Reactive security focuses on incident response, data recovery, and damage mitigation. But that's the problem. It's too late to prevent the damage that has been done and may continue to occur. That's where proactive security comes in, in which there is an effort focused on preventing attacks, identifying threats, and potentially preventing security catastrophes before they happen. It's about understanding the threat landscape, having visibility, and strengthening the defenses. This includes things like penetration tests, vulnerability scans, security awareness, and of course, threat hunting. There isn't just one way to threat hunt, and we'll go over three different ways to do so. First, there's structured threat hunting, or indicator-based threat hunting, which is the most common. This includes something like an IOC, or indicator of compromise, and TTPs, or tactics, techniques, and procedures. When both IOCs and TTPs are combined, an adversary profile can be developed. This is more geared towards finding known threats. For unstructured, this one's a little bit different, and it involves looking for behaviors. It's considered more advanced for organizations with more resources. Both structured and unstructured involve IOCs, but the way IOCs are investigated are different. An unstructured threat hunt could start from a single trigger or be from the identification of various patterns on the network. This could include going into logs from a seam and sifting through other data, and it might even uncover a threat that it's no longer active. This could be something like uncovering the past presence of an adversary in the network, which could show the footprint of the attacker. Another type in its own category, but does relate more so to structured threat hunting, is intelligence-driven threat hunting. This is the search for known threats, and it's where a threat hunter will take information from intelligence reporting and information gathering from various feeds. One organization known as ISAAC, or the Information and Sharing Analysis Center, is an organization that provides central resources for gathering information on cyber threats. They have various industry-specific ISACs for things like healthcare, financial services, and aviation. The downside to this model is that a team may spend more time hunting for threats that don't have an impact on the organization. I also wanted to talk about the hunting maturity model and how it relates to an organization. Not all organizations are advanced, and there are various reasons for this. So think about the size of an organization, its manpower, and the goals of an organization. This will determine how robust a threat hunting program is and if they have one at all. Some places you could work might have a dedicated threat hunting team and others will have one or two security analysts who respond to alerts. Or even maybe it's a sysadmin who handles those alerts. It really comes down to the quality of data and the skill level of the analysts. The initial level of the hunting maturity model is zero. And this is where the organization will heavily rely on tools, including an IDS or an intrusion detection system, seam logs, and antivirus alerts but it could also include signatures and indicators created by the analysts who will then put them into the monitoring systems. At this level, there isn't a lot of hunting going on and it's more related to response and alert resolution. Minimal is level one. At this level, there's still a heavy reliance on automated alerting systems, but there's more IT data collection, meaning there's a focus for more visibility into the environment. This data includes advanced SIEM information, including IOCs, domains, hashes, and URLs. Without visibility, you may not know that there are any threats. Threats are also tracked from open and closed sources. As mentioned earlier in the video, there are closed source intelligence resources like the ISACs. Level two is procedural, and this is considered to be the most prevalent in organizations and includes both analytical and hunting processes that are continuous. The custom procedures aren't yet developed, so they'll use those developed by others. They gather sometimes extremely large volumes of data from across the company. 
This data includes things like gathering data on which programs you're supposed to automatically start on hosts and least frequency analysis, requiring data from many hosts. Least frequency threat hunting can be challenging due to the vast amount of data there is and the amount of time it takes to analyze, along with how events that are infrequent are difficult to investigate. Level three is innovative, and at this level of hunting, the organization has at least a few threat hunters who understand several types of data analysis. At this level, an organization may start influencing the community with published procedures and information, and at the very least, they have well-defined internally developed procedures that are repeatable and performed on a regular basis. Over time, there will be new techniques developed that can lead analysts into new data sources with the goal of visibility, and this can be an issue for scalability as more procedures and processes are developed. The highest level of the hunting maturity model is level four, which is leading. This is essentially the same as level three, except it includes automation. As mentioned above, there's a scalability issue with level three, where the progress of the organization can cause a continuous increase on procedures and processes. The consistent and routine processes that are done frequently will be streamlined with automation, allowing for new threat hunting processes to be developed to improve the detection program as a whole. This allows the team to be quite effective at taking on adversaries and potential threats. Now that we've talked about the maturity models, I wanted to give a brief overview of the Pyramid of Pain. This is a model from David Bianco, who's a SANS instructor, and it relates to threat hunting and the value of IOCs. It shows the difference between pain levels the defense can inflict on an adversary when they're denied these indicators. Think about this as the time and resources the adversary must spend in order to continue to their goal. On the bottom, we have hash values. Hash values are something like SHA-1 and MD5, which are hashing algorithms that provide integrity of a file. These can be changed extremely easily in the code. Any change to the file will change the hash completely, even down to the bit. Next is IP addresses, which are also common indicators. IP addresses change all the time for various reasons, and it's extremely easy to do with VPNs and Tor. For domain names, it's nearly as easy to change as an IP address, and all it takes is just registering a new domain once it's blocked. Next is network artifacts and host artifacts. This one's a bit harder, as activities on the network will leave evidence behind. Threat hunters can look for these traces and link things together. This doesn't mean that an advanced adversary won't know how to hide and cover their tracks, but it's still time consuming. Some examples of this might include C2 information in the network protocols and URL patterns. Some host artifacts could include registry keys or strings of text that are known to be associated with specific malware. Next is tools, which are particularly challenging for an adversary. This is the actual software that an adversary will use. Think about a tool for a botnet on a system. One way you could identify this is the changes to the system settings that are required for the tool to operate an unusual process, or an indicator of a keep alive packet, which is a way to maintain a connection between two hosts. Once this is identified and stopped, the attacker will have to develop a new tool to use, which is a pretty big headache. The last and hardest thing for an adversary to change are the TTPs. This refers to the training of the adversary and their personal behaviors and things that they do, such as the commands they run within their own procedures. An example of this would be the process of data staging. And this might be when an attacker takes an encrypted file and transfers it to the exfiltration point. The defense could detect them through the commands and arguments they use to collect and combine the data. So I'd like to go into a possible real world scenario of what threat hunting may look like for a basic organization at minimal level one of the hunting maturity model. Say you're a security analyst for a large hospital network and part of your job is to respond to security alerts and also look at threat intelligence feeds for other threats related to your industry. The threat intel you get is from the closed intelligence group HISAC, which is the healthcare ISAC. You receive emails from other cybersecurity professionals in the healthcare industry, and they provide everything from YAR rules to information surrounding malicious email campaigns they've received. Your job is to check this incoming information with various tools within your organization. An email comes into your inbox from HISAC, and the feed shows that the analyst said a number of their users had numerous phishing emails arrived in their inboxes. These emails also included a malicious attachment. The email lists the name of the file, the incoming email address, and the IP. You go to your email security solution and run a search for the information you found in the feed. You discover that your organization has also been hit with the same phishing campaign within the last five minutes, and it's even from the same incoming email address. There are four users who have received an email with a malicious attachment. 
The process for your organization is to pull the emails from the inboxes and check to see if they've been opened. You're in luck in the security awareness training you provided to all employees helped them be successful in spotting that the email was malicious as they all reported it as phishing. You then place the email domain and IP on a block list. You successfully completed an intelligence driven threat hunting task. So what are your thoughts on threat hunting now? Threat hunting can be both a very specialized role within a team in an organization or more ad hoc. Thanks for watching. I hope you've learned more about threat hunting and have a better idea of what it's all about. I'd really appreciate it if you left a like on the video and please leave any questions or opinions down in the comment section below. Thanks.